Hey everyone, I'm Ben Norton of the Multipolarista podcast, and I'm joined by my two good friends, Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis of the American Exception podcast. And this is the Empire and Deep State series. This is part 14, and we are discussing the history of the U.S. Deep State and U.S. National Security State. We're continuing our discussion of chapter six of Aaron's book, American Exception, Empire and the Deep State. And this chapter lays out the history of the U.S. national security state. So in parts 12 and part 13 of this series, we talked about the creation of the CIA, of the National Security Council. We talked about um, NSC 68, which was this historic National Security Council strategy document published in 1950 that kind of outlaid out line the strategy for the first Cold War. We talked about the rise of Truman and the coup against Wallace. And now we're going to be going into the Eisenhower years. And Aaron, we'll start where we ended last, which was the end of the Truman administration. You laid out the coup in the, inside the Democratic National Convention against Henry Wallace. This was the very progressive, socialist-oriented vice president who served under FDR. And Pretty much everyone assumed that Henry Wallace was going to be president. He was the second most popular politician in the U.S. after FDR himself. But there was this coup against him inside the DNC, and that gave to the rise. It gave rise to Truman, who was this kind of empty vessel. And then the people around Truman had plans to create this international empire, and they created the infrastructure for the U.S. empire. So after Truman, you of course had Eisenhower. Eisenhower was a top general. The fact that he came from the military background, I think for a lot of people in, in this kind of new imperial establishment, they thought that he would be a, a key ally in helping to build this international empire. So how, how did Eisenhower continue or potentially change the trajectory that was established by the, by the Truman administration? So it's important to think of the historical context in which Eisenhower attained the presidency of the United States. Uh, the, the the nuclear issue was a big part of uh, world history and, and the new order that emerged at the end of World War II. And the U.S. deep state was born with atomic explosions, more or less. You could say the U.S. empire really begins with uh, the surrender of Japan. But really, this the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, end up uh, being used as a justification for the surrender that Japan wanted anyway, and it allowed Japan to surrender just to the United States. And so only the U.S. would have a hand in, in Japanese reconstruction and rehabilitation and de, the Japanese version of denazification um, that would be handled by the U.S., and this also which, which set ended off, up not being much defascification. <laughs> it was no. mostly just putting them all in power again. Yeah, the establishment remained. And they killed some people, some generals and other people, but the some of the worst of the, uh, the, the, the clandestine or spook operators were kept on, as well as the economic elites of Japan. It was very similar to what happens in Germany. Uh, Chalmers Johnson used to joke about the Sony Walkman, uh, that the, the tagline should have been uh, from the people who brought you Pearl Harbor, because the main Zaibatsu corporations all stayed in place in Japan, and this is how the U.S. wanted it. They wanted them to have a... a a capitalist oligarchy to uh, still be a capitalist oligarchy in Japan after the war, um, and yeah, and Shinzo Abe, the you know disgraced prime minister who was recently assassinated, his grandfather was a was a class A war criminal who oversaw Manchukuo, the the Japanese fascist colony in Manchuria, and then he became prime minister of Japan. His grandfather became prime minister of Japan under the protection of the U.S. So there you go. <laughs> yeah, it's a U.S. colony, just like uh, Germany today, you know, with like, uh, you know, thousands of U.S. troops stationed in Germany. And, uh, and if the U.S. wants to, they can blow up the pipeline that is most able to bring German fuel to Germany. And Germany can't say anything about it. So this is the world order that, that uh, we're living in. Just like Japan couldn't really say anything in the 80s when uh, they... The, the the bank for international settlements and the the U.S. Fed like uh, they essentially weakened Japanese uh, currency in terms of its international you know power and so on and really 
uh, neutered Japan as an economic rival to the United States, brought them back into a position of subservience. This is just how it's been. The, the ruling party of Japan is a CIA creation with lots of stolen money from uh, looted from the, the Chinese and from the rest of Asia. So these are this is the this is the world order that's that's set up. You have a new the Axis powers are all folded into the U.S. empire, bookends to Eurasia, really. Uh, G Germany on one side, Japan on the other. And this nuclear issue, the, it, the, the bombs did not need to be uh, detonated over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but they were. This leads to an arms race. In, by 1949, the Soviet Union acquires a bomb. And so that same year, the U.S. decides that they're going to deal with this by building a bigger bomb. And they start the hydrogen bomb. Uh, research and this is completed by uh, 1952, a little bit before uh, the election, right before the election of Eisenhower, and uh, it's on the island of Aluga Lab. And there were some photographs taken of the explosion, which were pretty spectacular. Um, later, uh, the Atomic Energy Commission chairman Gordon Dean told Eisenhower, um, "The island of Aluga Lab is missing." Okay, this is a reference to the fact that the island was no longer there. It had been destroyed by this hydrogen bomb detonation. And uh, they believed that this would give them some advantage over the Soviets. But of course, that only lasts for a little while. By August 1953, the Soviets get a hydrogen bomb. So this is the context of Eisenhower taking uh, the presidency and... He was a guy who ran on this campaign. He's this optimistic, uh, grandfatherly type character um, presiding over a boom economy once the military industrial complex gets rolling with the Korean War. Um, he, I like Ike as his campaign. And he takes over after Truman had been president from 45 to 53. Uh, Eisenhower wins, uh, gets, gets two terms. He beats Adelaide, Adelaide Stevenson twice uh, before Kennedy takes over. And uh, this is, he, he realizes that, and, and other, other administrators, other people uh, that are advisors and so on, they realize that the uh, Korean War was very expensive and it was kind of damaging to the stability of U.S. finances and it was exploding budget deficits. Supposedly, Korea is this emergency. So Eisenhower and other people who are a little more sober want to kind of rein in some of these expenses. Uh, to keep the U.S. from hemorrhaging gold, for example, by running balance of payments deficits. But as we talked about in the last episodes, this war machine was done to uh, to was created in the military industrial complex and the permanently uh, the permanent war economy was created as a way to deal with problems with uh, the dollar gap between the U.S. and Europe and also East Asia. So the Korean War and massive military spending are what solved this problem. However, it caused huge deficits in the United States and it eroded the U.S. gold position. So people who were interested in in managing U.S. hegemony and not totally, you know, pissing away the massive amount of wealth that the U.S. had at the end of World War II, they want to rein this in. And this the result is the new look of Eisenhower, which is going to continue containment and continue the military industrial complex, but try to ramp down a little bit of the weapons production. And with a bigger investment in nuclear weapons. So massive retaliation is the dullest plan for any sort of Soviet attack. And the idea is that this is gonna deter the Soviets from ever attacking. It's like you're acknowledging mutually asserted destruction and it means ramping up the nuclear arsenal to be able to do that. They also thought instead of very, very, very expensive military occupations and operations like the Korean War, they could rely more on covert operations. And so this is what this is what they do. The new look is based on a big reappraisal of U.S. military expenditures that Eisenhower undertook uh, right after being elected, and it gets formalized by NSC document 16 or 162-2, uh, approved in October of 1953. And this is Eisenhower's plan to offer something different than what Truman was doing. And Eisenhower is very much a creature of this nexus between the national security state and then Wall Street or the corporate state and uh, and the military Keynesianism that is happening that's sort of buoying the post-war U.S. economy is also 
a form like we talked about last week of siphoning off surplus toward the wealthy and uh, away from being redistributed down into the population at the same time as being a massive payday for those people. So he's a really good representative of the way that there's a collision at this point between Wall Street and, of course, him being a massively popular general uh, as a result of World War II. And so, uh, you know, a, another way that he's very representative is the way that he's being courted prior to running for president by both the GOP and the Democrats uh, to run for either party. So it's not like he has some deep commitments to some party project. Um, he is representative of Wall Street in that way, because there is the false, uh, you know, uh, duality between the parties here that we see by the fact that both of them are trying to run the same guy. And so in the end, they, I, I think by, by no small stretch, the Dulles brothers are able to help get him to, uh, to run for the GOP in the end. Um, but he is able to preside over as a result of all this, the golden age for Wall Street and Wall Street's tool, uh, the covert operations that they want to run. So how is the, and why and how are the deep state able to bring about this golden age and, and grow underneath the Eisenhower administration? Well, Eisenhower was, uh, as I try to get, convey, a creature of uh, big oil and Wall Street backed forces. He could have run as a Democrat. He was a guy whose popularity was such that he could have gone to either ticket the uh, it was probably more useful for the deep state to have a Republican president because they don't have the same ties to labor and other kind of New Deal institutions that the Democrats had, like, uh, you know, Truman, even though he sort of betrays Wallace and the legacy of the New Deal, they still had some more New Deal leanings than the Republicans, uh, even though they were they, both parties were largely liberal and pro empire at this point, liberal in the American liberalism sense, like not not meaning leftist, but like you know liberals, post war liberalism. So Eisenhower is backed with a, a a ton of oil money. This is what really propels him to the White House. His popularity from World War II and big money, and the uh, the ways the the clearest connections between Eisenhower and the uh, the same people that created the U.S. empire and that ran like the Council on Foreign Relations and so on, is his connection to two uh, figures from Sullivan and Cromwell, storied Wall Street law firm, the Dulles Brothers. Okay, so the Seven Sisters were one of the main clients for Sullivan and Cromwell, one of the biggest collections of corporate wealth in the world, the cartel that ran the international oil industry for all intents and purposes. And uh, so they, having some people that were of Sullivan and Cromwell in high positions in the White House was uh, very convenient for, for corporate America. So they had Secretary of State John Foster Dulles uh, and the brother Alan Dulles. Okay, now John Foster Dulles was a Sullivan and Cromwell lawyer. He had helped Hitler to secure bond sales to West Germany, or sorry, to Germany, to rearm Germany under Hitler, right? So this was when this this is where the Nazi rhetoric about being all against international finance, uh, you know, and that e being equal to Jew international Jewry is is you know revealed as a as a hoax because a lot of the rearmament of Nazi Germany comes from international finance, and you know people like Dulles and these other back the other people that he represented were more waspy than. Than, than Jewish, but they were definitely international finance, you know, this, so that they, they, they weren't, you can't really international finance sort of like the way the uh, MAGA people talk about globalists today. It's uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of a way to avoid, you use these terms to avoid dealing with corporate capitalism more or less. So John Foster Dulles was a guy who was really worried about first and foremost with the interests of business. And he, has this great quote where he's t writing about cartels in the year 1930, and he is sort of speaking about the international businessman's point of view here. He's really voicing that. He says, most of these politicians are highly insular and nationalistic because politics has been so backward. Business people have had to find ways for getting through and around stupid political barriers. Okay, so this is just a way of saying that like all these elected officials and so on, they don't know what's good. We business people are used to working out deals and handling things our own on our own. 
And this is the mentality that they have. The, the interests of corporate America are one and the same with the interests of the United States. That's the, that's the way he sees it. And, and Foster kept relations going with the Nazis and with their affiliates in Nazi Germany longer than was appropriate. This, it, was, it became something of a, of a scandal, his loyalty uh, to these certain Nazi figures and the offices that were still running uh, even after the, the, the Nazis had become clearly enemies of the United States. Um, Among other things that included hiding IG Farben's uh, assets, also keeping them in control of them to create like supply bottlenecks in uh, in Nazi assets that produced like military material for the U.S. war machine, uh, and then also helping them launder the money for Nazi looted gold that was taken from Jewish families out of the mouths of prisoners in, in concentration camps, uh, and, and eventually using all that gold to fund covert operations. But along the way, doing that through things like the Bank of International uh, Settlements, which was headed by Thomas McKittrick, who was like one of Dulles's best friends and confidants and an OSS agent. And so, uh, you know, it, it Foster spends a lot of this time being the go-between with the Nazis and uh, the Bank of International Settlements was said by, uh, I, I believe, Hemmler to be the uh, Reichsbank's only foreign or, or uh, international arm. And so, uh, you know, he's sort of the U.S. tie between London Germany and the U.S. to to keep the money flowing, to keep control over the U.S. assets, uh, including following the war, and uh, and that cements their position when th there's a prospect that Germany and their financial interests might be broken up after after the war. Yeah, and McKittrick, uh, a lot, Foster, and Mc John Foster Dulles, and Thomas McKittrick, even more so, uh, they likely would have been prosecuted if FDR had lived. And, and or if Henry Wallace had not been, you know, ousted in that coup in 1944. Um, but they weren't, they weren't prosecuted. And the U.S. Ad administration went pretty, pretty uh, decidedly to the right by getting rid of Wallace and putting Truman up there. Um, and John Foster Dulles later on, instead of being in jail by this time or otherwise, uh, you know, discredited and uh, disgraced, he is able to become Secretary of State, and his brother is able to run the CIA. And at one point, a reporter asks Alan Dulles, "What is the CIA?" And Dulles, Alan Dulles's response is that it's the State Department for unfriendly countries. Okay, so if you think <laughs> about that, under Eisenhower, you have diplomacy for friendly countries run by the State Department, John Foster Dulles, Sullivan and Cromwell. Unfriendly countries, they get the CIA run by Sullivan and Cromwell man, Alan Dulles. Uh, so either way, you're getting Dulles, you're getting Sullivan and Cromwell, you're getting Wall Street's finest uh, running U.S. foreign policy and diplomacy. Aaron, the, I'm the sorry. Imperial, to... It's the imperial good cop, bad cop. Wall Street's good cop, bad cop. Yeah. Except they're, they're brothers. Both bad cops, but... <laughs> and I hate, I hate to cut in with that. Just one more tidbit on that. It's not just us as like lefties saying, oh, this is treasonous and they should have gone to jail or... You know, FDR didn't like him. The Supreme Court justice, who we've talked about uh, quite a bit now, Arthur Goldberg himself said that uh, Foster would have been, you know, held for treason uh, had FDR lived. And so, you know, famed leftists like Supreme Court justices are, are on the same page here that this was treasonous behavior in, in the war. And uh, and it's very clear that like it's it goes beyond just loyalty to capital itself. Uh, to some kind of deeper sympathy there uh, with not just the inter interests of international capital, but with the Nazi movement specifically, and uh, and then by extension, the post-war American empire. Yeah, and Dulles, Alan Dulles in particular, is probably the real face of the American empire. And this is, I think, appropriate because he's not the one that people would first think of most of the time. Uh, because and that's really the way that power operates in America increasingly is that it's from loftier circles and carried out by leg men for uh, the real ruling powers in America. And Alan Dulles really exemplifies that. He was a lawyer for Sullivan and Cromwell. He had two uncles who had been secretaries of state uh, in the past. He worked for on what you could call oil intelligence uh, while also working with the State Department. So this was a common practice for people to do work for Standard Oil 
while they were working uh, in, in under official State Department, you know, assignments. And uh, this th this allowed them to intertwine foreign policy with economic policy. And it's a real, you know, kind of nefarious way to organize things. Huge conflicts of interest, very anti-democratic, but that's the way it worked. And Dulles really uh, personified this. He was also the vice president of the Council on Foreign Relations uh, when the War and Peace Studies Project was written, which laid out the plans for the American empire. And he in particular wrote the sections dealing with sovereignty and security, uh, which are still classified to this day. So most of the War and Peace Studies Project has been declassified. This part has not. So Peter and other people speculate that this uh, section called for the creation of some sort of clandestine service with the ability to use to do covert operations in countries in order to keep you know the american economic empire running smoothly uh so this is you know would be really interesting to know what's going on there but the fact that he wrote that that he was the vice president of this of the cfr during this time period is really important in terms of understanding what the cia is he helps too as a oss officer uh in europe in world war ii he helps to rescue Nazis and rehabilitate Nazis. This allows the U.S. after the fact to establish, to basically take over management of the Axis or the Anti-Comintern Pact, right? They set up their own Anti-Comintern, which is what the Nazis called the, uh, you know, the alliance, the actual pact of the Axis nations was all about anti-communism. And the U.S. just picks those assets up and rolls them up into, for their own purposes. So most famously, uh, this is laid out in David Talbot's book, Devil's Chessboard, really well. Alan Dulles, as part of Operation Sunrise, um, he rescues Carl Wolf, who was the chief of staff under Himmler, a guy who uh, was involved in all sorts of atrocities and war crimes, one, would have been one of the more notorious war criminals. And uh, Dulles helps to secure his early surrender and uh, re more or less try tries to rehabilitate, works to rehabilitate him as best as possible. He also oversees recovery of uh, SS gold, which is later used, as Seamus mentioned, in to fund covert operations, including uh, secret Marshall Plan funding to do various things in, in Europe after World War II, like set up Gladio networks and so on. Um, that's part of the anti common turn business that Dulles helps to establish. Also, Alan Dulles's protege, Edward Lansdale, uh, discovers gold in the Philippines. Japanese war loot This is laid out well in Sterling Seagrave's book, Gold Warriors, which has been endorsed by Chalmers Johnson, great scholar of, of Japanese history, politics, and also of the, the U.S. empire. So this, uh, and this money is never really explained what happens to this money. Some of that, that loot from the war is used to set up Japan and make it into a one-party state. Uh, with the help of Yoshio Kadama, a war criminal that the CIA springs from jail. Uh, and other parts, we don't even really know what it went, probably to funding things like the East Asian People's Anti-Communist League. You know, there's all sorts of money rolling around in there. I mean, for all we know, that could be the money that's funding uh, the Epoch Times and Shen Yun, you know, the, and the Falun Gong CIA cult uh, that you, you can see videos for and stories on on the internet these days. So th these things have long roots and they are uh, they show the power of Alan Dulles. This was money that should have gone to the victims of Nazism and to the victims of Japanese imperialism. You know, there were tens of millions of people killed by Japanese militarism uh, and their efforts to create their own empire in East Asia. Uh, the, the money and the gold that was looted represented centuries worth of accumulated wealth in these societies. And the Japanese took it. Some of it went back to Japan and was never recovered. Some of it was recovered by the Americans. Uh, famously, a guy found like a solid gold Buddha in the Philippines and Marcos tortured him uh, until he gave it up. And then he won it back in a, a billion dollar judgment in a court in Hawaii, I think. And then somehow they said, oh, no, it was fake. But that's very dubious. But we're just talking about massive amounts of wealth that were able to be used by the clandestine part of the United States because that part served uh, the this imperial agenda. And so. These are, this is why Alan Dulles is, you know, maybe the most important guy if you're talking about understanding the United States and the U.S. empire. And it's not because he's really the guy running it. He's a, he's a leg man, okay? He's the person among the deep state people. This is, having to work and orchestrate all these things isn't the best, 
job and it's not the most lucrative job. It's just, you need someone really sinister and motivated and who has a lot of connections. And that's what he was when he died. He was in poor health. Uh, he dies in his not, not especially old. I think he drank too much, probably from his guilty conscience. And, uh, it's written about in David Talbot's book, the devil's chessboard that he was there in like piss soaked sheets and his family wasn't taking that care much, that much care of him because he was kind of hated by his own family. Uh, and he wasn't exceptionally wealthy either, as I said, but he had lived his life serving the most powerful people in the world. And in the end, he was it was really a kind of sad, pitiful departure from, you know, this life uh, because that he, he, he wasn't the oligarchy. He was the the leg man for these people. And you got to understand that if you want to understand uh, what this what the CIA is, what the U.S. empire is all about, um, these people are important. Uh, but they're not the ones running things. So Alan Dulles is not the grand master of the Illuminati. He's really a servant of corporate wealth. Yeah, very, very well said. Aaron, I, I want to emphasize the oil element of this because you you made, you, you made a really important um, uh, observation about the close ties between the oil industry and intelligence. This is something that is certainly not just in that era that we're talking about of the Dole's brothers. You can, of course, also see another major intelligence linked family, the Bush family, which have extensive links to the oil industry, Zapata oil, of course, uh, Poppy, the, you know, Bush senior, George um, HW was CIA director and a CIA asset working with Zapata oil. He was involved in oil and, and intelligence. And you talked about how Alan Dulles as a corporate lawyer worked for the oil industry and how Eisenhower came to power with the support of the Seven Sisters, which were the, the oil monopolies that dominated the international oil market at that time. So, of course, when Eisenhower comes to power, oil is a huge part of how his administration governs. Talk about how the, the Eisenhower administration dealt with the oil industry. Well, Eisenhower was, as uh, we can see, a guy who loved to play golf and he loved uh, hanging out with rich people. Uh, this was what this was like one of the main characteristics of his presidency was that he just became very close to super and the years leading up to that, very close to super rich people. Uh, and the the oil industry was controlled by the Seven Sisters, a cartel at this time, which was Mobile Shell, um, the Stand Esso, which is Standard Oil of uh, New Jersey, and then. Uh, like Saconi, I think, Standard Oil of New York, and then Gulf Oil, Texaco, and BP, which is was Anglo-Persian oil at that time, or Anglo-Iranian oil company, right? And Shell is a Dutch company. So uh, two of these are, Ameri are are not American country companies, and then five of them are U.S. companies. Uh, and they have a, they're, it's, they try to break up Standard Oil. It doesn't really seem to change so much. You have, um, th there's no more Standard Oil, so they changed the name of of, of Standard Oil of New Jersey to SO, which is of course Standard Oil, SO, haha, Rockefeller gets the last laugh. They've merged with, you know, now it's like ExxonMobil, right? So it's like they've reformed in some ways. So it's, this, this is a top oligarchy in corporate form over oil, which is needed for to fuel the entire economy. Enormous amounts of money for these oil companies uh, basically are able to profit off of the entire in industrial activity of the United States and around the world. So this is uh, Eisenhower depends on these people and you can really see the influence they had over him with this one episode uh, because we already, I, we pointed out in previous episode that it was a standard oil, like a standard oil connected guy named Pauly who actually got rid of Wallace and put Truman into the vice presidency and thus the presidency himself. So it's not like Truman was uh, wanting to nationalize oil or that Truman was some kind of radical Eugene Debs character or something like that. But he had some loyalty to the new to New Deal ideas and an anti big business pro little guy kind of outlook. Uh, and he and, he, and maybe it's just for appearances needed to appear to look to be sticking up for democracy over uh, corporate wealth. So there was an antitrust case against the seven sisters for uh, their cartel arrangements. And it's 1952, Truman is seeking up to break up these cartel agreements. The government at the time under Truman was looking to get the documents that they needed from these corporations so that they could confront them on these issues. And there's a quote here 
uh, that I think is really priceless from Arthur Dean, where he's being asked by Congress that, okay, you need to turn over these documents so that we can make sure that you are following the law and that you are not engaging in harmful uh, com anti-competitive practices that would be against the public interest. And Arthur Dean of Sullivan and Cromwell tells Congress, if not for the question of national security, we would be perfectly willing to face either a criminal or a civil suit. But this is the kind of information the Kremlin would love to get its hands on. And this is not a statesman saying this. This isn't the guy running the CIA saying this or a general. This is a, a, a corporate lawyer. So this is where we see the deep state. This is really the deep state in action. And it's one of those rare occasions where like they actually assert sovereignty and we see, you know, where sovereignty really lies in the United States. And so why would this guy think that he had the standing to say this? Well, his biography might help explain. He was a, a member and later served on the board of directors for Rockefeller, Wall Street, uh, Council on Foreign Relations. He was a U.S. delegate to the United Nations at one point. He was a member of the Bilderberg Group Steering Committee and participated in 14 of their conferences between 1957 and 1975. His Bilderbergs, Bilderbergers are uh, Rockefeller and CIA connected. I believe Peter has written in one of his books, at least, that part of those Marshall funds, the secret funds in the Marshall Fund went to uh, one outlet that was controlled by Prince Bernard and was basically Bilderberg, more or less. That This was one of the things that they funded to coordinate uh, consensus between the relevant elites in Europe and the United States. So the, the Bilderbergers are, you know, a serious thing that we should look at, not in a nutty conspiratorial way, but just to understand the ways that rich, powerful people network in this in the system that we live under. And Aaron, now, to your point about like oil companies as sort of a sovereign state power in themselves, uh, on top of that, that quote really, you know, captures exactly the way they think of themselves, that they can claim some sort of like national security privilege in front of Congress of all places. But at the time, there's uh, there's plenty of accounts of uh, things like Exxon and Shell, their offices in a lot of these third world countries and, uh, as, you know, specifically places where there's oil, obviously, they had more sway and more political power and more in like local political machines, far more power than the U.S. embassy did. So a lot of the time they are exercising this outsized state sized influence more than any other country in the world could on, a, on like a foreign government they are exercising that level of power. And so they do have this, uh, you know, uh, like we're going to talk about, these covert operations start as uh, oil intelligence operations for that reason, because in a lot of ways, they're operating on the same exact level, on that sort of stratospheric, like level of power that it, it's hard to even get across it because it's so, it's hidden. It's not, it doesn't function in the same way as we understand the public state to. But that is why these guys are able to, lay some claim to like that level of uh of global power yeah there's a uh if we have propaganda fans here i think there's a clip yeah. uh, of a of a shell executive on their on the second propaganda album they have this british shell executive reading this speech where he says something to the effect of a world where multinational corporations exercise more power than local governments would be a frightening and bleak world indeed and uh which is, of course, outrageous for somebody to say that he was really denying Shell's involvement in like, I think I think it was maybe the death of some Nigerian protesters or something like that. And he just says, we didn't do that. That would be a scary thing if oil companies were more powerful than governments. But, you know, of course, they often are. Um, and it's a question as to how they stack up to the U.S. government, like which what's the, who's in the junior position between the U.S. government and the oil companies. And here Arthur Dean was saying, you know, we'd love to tell you these things. We just can't. Kremlin would like that too much. So you're not going to be able to get those documents. Uh, he was additionally, another thing about Arthur Dean is he was a part of the Asia Society, which was funded by, founded by the Rockefellers in 1956. Uh, in 1967, John D. Rockefeller III gave a speech in New York City saying, we founders of Asia Society were confident that Asians and Americans are capable of a richer and more meaningful mutual understanding because of shared hopes, fears, and aspirations. Okay, so this is a Rockefeller guy talking about Asian, Asia, and Asian, Asian and American cooperation. And it was a Rock. It was Dulles uh, and CIA 
uh, and these types of people who were responsible for this 1965 Indonesia coup that uh, massacred uh, you know, a million, maybe more uh, Indonesian peasants in order to have a regime change so that Rockefeller's Freeport uh, Sulfur Company could control the biggest gold mine in world history that hadn't really, that wasn't even, that was unknown to the actual president of Indonesia before that bloody coup. So these are the, the most sinister uh, and avaricious forces uh, around that are in positions of power. And uh, they have this, these sort of sober, uh, these sober lawyerly figures as their front men uh, that you, you know, you'd see maybe appearing in front of Congress or wherever. And then the covert side of things is carried out by these same forces. And you don't see that as much. It takes like decades for Indonesia to even, we're still trying to put together the exact details of what happened in 1965. And Indonesians didn't knew almost nothing about it until Joshua Oppenheimer's movie became yeah. widely viewed because of the internet. They couldn't stop it. Otherwise they'd really censored that whole affair. So all of these forces are very uh, interlocked and nefarious. And uh, we we see this in the Eisenhower administration. Now, later- yeah, really, really quickly, Aaron, I mean, you, you were talking about Oppenheimer's amazing documentary, The Act of Killing, but I should also add that, you know, speaking of the CIA, the CIA itself acknowledged in an internal memo that the genocide in 1965 and 1966 in Indonesia, in which one to three million leftists were killed, communists, left-wing sympathizers, union organizers, teachers, the CIA ad ad admitted internally that that was one of the worst atrocities in the 20th century, and it put it put on the same level as like the Nazi Holocaust. So, and of course, the CIA was deeply involved in these mass killings in Indonesia. So, I mean, th this is a clear internal acknowledgement by some of the people involved in these atrocities that they are at a, at a comparable level with the Nazis. And yet, of course, the flippant comments from their spokespeople at these corporate law firms is, well, you know, uh, it's it's it, we can't share this information because it's ab above your pay grade, Congress people. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, with the Indonesia case, uh, you had Ralph McGahey, who was a CIA dissident later and but had worked for the agency for a long time, was going to kill himself and then eventually thought that he could do more good if he actually spoke out about the agency. But he said that for a time he was the custodian of a top secret report on what the CIA role in Indonesia and how it was considered in the agency to be like a masterpiece of covert action. And we've never gotten the the details on that. What appears happens is we'll get into later on here and I've gone over in the podcast and we're going to do more on this, but the CIA apparently tricked some generals into uh, kidnapping some people who they believed might be staging a coup and they have these people murdered. And then the right wing generals are able to blame these other generals for this. And it's used to start a huge slaughter uh, in Indonesia and eventually put the CIA's guy, Sue Harto into power. Uh, and he's a puppet for 30 years and turns Indonesia back into a, or well into a neo colony of the United States, and that's these are the kind of people that we're that we're dealing with here with Dulles's Sullivan and Cromwell, Rockefeller Group, and so on. So this is this is really it's notable to see what happens with this antitrust case under Truman against the Seven Sisters. When Eisenhower takes office, he gets elected on with all this oil money. Uh, the antitrust case goes from the Justice Department. It's moved. Eisenhower moves it from the Justice Department to the State Department, which is headed by John Foster Dulles. The State Department had never undertaken any kind of antitrust investigation before, so this was totally unprecedented. And uh, the result is, as you would guess, that these seven sisters remain pretty much unscathed from uh, any kind of antitrust action that would be taken against them. So this is this is how it plays out. And it's very instructive to look at Arthur Dean, look at who he was, look at who was backing him, and then look at what happens when Eisenhower takes over. Because Truman was a Wall Street guy, was put in by Wall Street, but he wasn't Wall Street and wasn't imperialist enough. And so Eisenhower is able to yeah, uh, you know, correct that that problem as uh, as Wall Street would define it. And this is effectively a victory for the Wall Street oil forces over the course of about a decade, pushing back any sort of uh, 
of hope that there might be. Obviously, it's unimaginable now that there would be antitrust legislation against ExxonMobil or something uh, or, or any kind of prosecution at all. Uh, you know, it, even things like Stephen Donziger in uh, in Ecuador is able to be kind of pushed back on by corporate courts in New York. So like the the deep rootedness has only gotten worse from there. Uh, um, but at the at the end of the war, I mean, we have a combination of the push forth like oil money and and like I was talking about the Bank of International Settlements uh, are they're talking about breaking that up, too. And so there's. Uh, you know, effectively just push back from all sides to to take out any sort of new dealer uh, uh, interests, et cetera, and put in people like Eisenhower. Uh, and, and a good case study for that is Iran. And so we're going to talk about Operation Ajax, which was the process of um, of driving Mossadegh out and uh, and essentially trying to turn Iran into a oil client state for America. And uh, and what we're going to talk about is the Eisenhower administration, but it's it's it should be emphasized that it's not just uh, the government. I mean, people like Hanson Baldwin of The New York Times offered John Foster Dulles total cooperation in The New York Times's coverage, the paper of record in the 1953 CIA coup. So th this runs Shocker. way deeper than just sort of the, the top tiers uh, of government. All the way through the media that there's that there's going to be total cooperation and information control when it comes to these operations but when we turn specifically to the eisenhower administration which we know is in the pocket of these big corporations how is operation ajax a, a good case study for understanding the eisenhower administration's essentially fealty to these deep political forces right this is the, uh, I think, perfect encapsulation of the Eisenhower administration is maybe the, the way that Operation Ajax plays out and the fate of Iran during this time period. Iran was a huge strategic prize in the Cold War from an early date. The first nuclear bomb threats, to my knowledge, that the U.S. used, the U.S. Use, has used uh, nuclear weapons as a diplomatic tool uh, over and over again throughout history, which makes some of the hysteria over Putin, pe the people people freaking out over Putin, who's more or less just pointed out that mutually assured destruction is still in effect here. Like it's, it's funny to think about the reactions to uh, in America from that, given that the US has threatened to use nuclear weapons so many times. First, I believe in, we're in 1946, uh, Senator Henry Scoop Jackson, you know, our, our little senator from Boeing, uh, he, he revealed that Truman had told the Soviet ambassador, Andre Gromyko, I believe this was printed in Time magazine, it's in uh, Untold History of the United States, told Gromyko uh, that if the Soviet troops weren't out in 48 hours, we're going to drop it on you, okay, drop the bomb on you. And they were they withdrew anyway, and it's you know, people argue over whether it was really the nuclear threat that made that happen. But regardless, the U.S. was already using nuclear weapons as a, you know, for as a threat. Uh, and it was over Iran because Iran was with its oil and location was very important. So in, in you see the uh, and the U.S., because it had been dominated by Iran, but the U.S. is now wanting to manage, you know, global capitalism. And uh, the Shah is going to be their man. And he makes a visit to uh, New York City, to the United States, and he speaks at the uh, Council on Foreign Relations. They have a big party that Alan Dulles hosts for the Shah in the dining room at the Council on Foreign Relations headquarters. And he says, uh, which would have been music to the ears of the CFR crowd, the Shah said, Iran is eager to welcome American capital to give it all possible safeguards. Nationalization of industry is not planned. Around this same time, you had the uh, these financial people and people in positions like like Alan Dulles with the CFR, who's sort of a go between. He's working for the government, but also very close to these uh, corporate entities. They're working on this huge deal, which would have been the biggest development deal at that point in in America in U.S. history. It, uh, they it was. Dulles was representing Overseas Consultants Incorporated, which was a consortium of 11 U.S. engineering firms. And they negotiated with the, the Shah a $650 million deal, dollar deal to modernize Iran. This would, be a, a, this would have U.S. companies building all sorts of infrastructure and other development deals 
for Iran, you know, to be paid for with oil revenue and so on. Um, biggest international deal in history up to that point, not just for the U.S., I believe for anyone. And this, this, so this, they are very focused on Iran and developing Iran for the benefit of corporate America. Okay. And the Shah is going to be their man. And he's there. He's talking to the people at the Council on Foreign Relations saying, we're really eager to welcome American capital. We're not even thinking about nationalizing anything. No, sir. Okay. Now there's a problem here. And that is the Iranian people. The Iranian people have been dominated by the British for a long time. And they are sick of it. And so in, as you would expect in a democracy, if there's a chance for a democracy, people would want to vote for the leader that would look after the national interest. Uh, crazy as that sounds, that's something that's supposed to happen in a democracy. Um, and the issue is the uh, Anglo-Iranian, the Anglo-Persian Petroleum Company is the dominant economic actor in Iran, Iran's main product on the international market is oil. Uh, they're a huge oil producer. And the Anglo-Persian Petroleum Company, which eventually becomes the Anglo-Iranian Oil Company and then eventually becomes British Petroleum, they are essentially stealing Iranian oil. Uh, they are paying so little for it and the workers are so exploited. It basically amounts to uh, the, the free gas station for the British Navy. And it's one of the main things that they still are able to hold on to uh, with the British Empire uh, after World War II. Uh, you can see the, these some pictures of the Abaddon refinery, this huge complex built by BP. Uh, you know, that's, I think there's, there's still big refineries there. It's just this massive uh, operation for refining oil that amounts to stealing Iranian oil. And the guy who emerges as the embodiment of Iranian nationalism is Mohammad Mossadegh. So in 1950, he leads this is the National Front, a group of a consortium of uh, Iranian, you know, political entities. They kill this deal, the overseas consultants deal. That's one of the first things that, that he's able to, to do with this National Front is to stop this deal, which would have put the Iranians in debt to U.S. companies and would have continued the, you know, plunder of Iranian oil. So he's very popular. In 1951, he's elected prime minister and he nationalizes Iranian oil. He gets two Time Magazine covers for doing this. Okay, Time Magazine, run by the guy of uh, published the publisher of Time Magazine is Henry Luce, the CFR guy who wrote the essay, "The American Century," which was more like a pamphlet for the U.S. Empire, as as designed by Wall Street. And he, by putting Mossadegh on here twice, you know that the uh, oligarchy of the United States is very concerned about this figure. And so the earlier version. Uh, the earlier edition that he appears on the cover of, there's an oil uh, derrick in the background with the Iranian flag. And then in the second uh, cover, it's he's the man of the year. And it says something of the effect of like, he's he's like sewing, he oiled the wheels of chaos. That's what it says. And there's fists in the backgrounds coming up from uh, Egypt and Iran. And those represent nationalism. And we're supposed to think this is bad. He's oiling the wheels of chaos. He's damaging the interests of the empire. Uh, and so this is this is bad, and we're supposed to be frightened by this. Uh, he did include in his political uh, coalition a small group of communists, the Iranian Communist Party called the, the Tuda Party. And but they were not really in the driver's seat at all. They were every everyone in the country, like 90% or so, was on board with the nationalist aspirations of Mossadegh. And that included nationalizing oil. Uh, when you think about this as an American, you think, why would any country want to not have their, their oil industry nationalized? Because would you rather, or, or you know, would you rather David John Rockefeller or David Rockefeller own all the oil, or would you rather it be owned by you and everybody everybody else? You know, it like it just seems some for, in some cases the arguments were kind of socialist or nationalist. Uh, organizations are so obvious. It's just you you wonder how they can keep them from ever from from you know becoming real. Of course, they you make all that money selling oil, then you can bribe people to protect that indefinitely, apparently. So the reaction from uh, the Seven Sisters Oil Company to Mossadegh is pretty serious. And this is where really the operation to get rid of Mossadegh begins. It's not that it starts with MI6 or it starts with um, the uh, the CIA, it's really 
the seven sisters. Um, so laid out here, you can see uh, you've got mobile, Gulf, SO, BP, Texaco, Shell Oil, Royal Dutch Shell, and Chevron and versus the Iranian people and Mossadegh as their champion. Uh, and there were big protests over this that they were because the, the boycott basically means that they can't ship oil out from there. So Iran's not able to sell oil, which means that the, it's a crisis and a fiscal leads to a fiscal crisis for the government. So in May of 1970, or 1951, the Seven Sisters launched this boycott, uh, which is really the deep state. I mean, this is the deep state in action. The Seven Sisters represent the deep state. They represent corporate oligarchy, not uh, totally uh, a kind of power outside and above the U.S. Constitution. Um, so they launch this boycott. They get others to go along. It's really BP whose oil is at risk here because of the nationalization. But all of these other companies are interested not because they want to get some of this oil, although the way it works out, American companies do get more oil. But the real issue is you can't allow Mossadegh to be able to get away with this because if he does and Iran is successful, then why would other countries not want to use their own resources to develop their own countries, right? The threat of a good example, as they say. Exactly. I mean, this is so obvious to see if you're thinking a lot, you know, the logic that they would apply if you're just a businessman, you think, yeah, you, you couldn't have that. So that's a nightmare. And that same logic is why the U.S. just wants to crush socialism everywhere, even in America, even things that aren't even super profitable, they want to crush. If there's any kind of nationalist public uh, minded institution in the United States that they want to, they want to privatize it. Like they want to privatize the post office even. I mean, these guys are, they believe that corporate power should be the end all be all of human civilization and everything should be organized around that. Mossadegh, a threat to that, he had to go. Uh, yeah. I mean, Bernie Sanders honestly would probably be considered to the right of Mohammed Mossadegh, but even, you know, for the ruling class on the U S Bernie was seen as too much of a threat to even allow him to run in the election. Yeah, I mean, and this, the Seven Sisters are able to, with this boycott, they are able to really stick it to the Iranians. Oil production goes from 241 million in 1950 to 10.6 million in 1952. So from 241 to 11 uh, million barrels, basically, from between 50 and 52. They control. They were able to do this because they controlled 99% of oil tankers, and they also controlled the oil markets themselves. Um, and the way that they were able to handle this problem was to use the secret weapon of the 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 oil oligarchy, as some people have called it, uh, which is they use the Saudi Arabia Aramco, which is a joint U.S. Saudi venture, to ramp up production so that they could make up for the loss of Iranian oil. This is something that they've done repeatedly. Uh, you know, since since the end of World War II, Saudis can ramp up production when they want to crash the oil prices. They did it fairly recently, uh, I believe, you know, just under Obama. This was done and it crashed the oil prices. And I believe that this was done to weaken Russia, Iran and Venezuela. So uh, I don't know that they can do that anymore. It seems like, A, Saudi Arabia is not as cooperative. And B, they don't quite have the overwhelming ability to produce uh, compared to the side, like their production abilities are a little lower and then you world demand is higher. So the U S is kind of losing that ability too, along with everything else. Yeah. You're um, referring to there, there were a series of meetings in 2014 between John Kerry, who was secretary of state under Obama and he went to Saudi Arabia and there was an agreement made. It was reported on by Reuters. And this is back when King Abdullah was still in charge in Saudi Arabia. He died in 2015. Of course, it changed. You mentioned, you know, uh, King Salman came in and, it's, and eventually his son, MBS, who's a little too independent for the U.S., although he's, you know, certainly not some great anti-imperialist. I mean, the war in Yemen is his doing brutal scorched earth war. But anyway, the point is that in 2014, there was this meeting where Saudi Arabia and the U.S. Uh, well, the U.S. basically forced Saudi Arabia to massively overproduce oil, to overpump oil which would flood the market with, with, with supply and you have this, this, the same amount of demand. So that means that prices fall and that plummeted the oil revenue in Russia, in 
Uh, also, Brazil, this is at the time of leading up to the coup against the Workers' Party, which fueled a an economic crisis against Dilma Rousseff's government leading up to the impeachment against her, the soft coup. And of course, Venezuela, this is the beginning of the sanctions on Venezuela. And of course, this is also right after the coup in Ukraine. And it was when the West began imposing sanctions on Russia over the annexation of Crimea. And we now see something very similar. You know, there was this democratic referendum in Crimea. We now see the referenda in Donbass. So, but anyway, the point is that this was like this moment where, you know, everything just came to the fore. It was like uh, this this extremely destabilizing moment where the U.S. was just trying to kneecap all of these countries. Russia with the sanctions and the drop of energy prices. Brazil, which relies on, relies on oil exports for a significant part of its um, revenue. And the coup against Dilma Rousseff. And then, of course, the beginning of the coup attempt against Venezuela, which has never really stopped. So, I mean, it's that that like entire books can be written about what happened in 20, 2014. Like that was such a crazy year and it didn't work at the end of the day. Well, it worked in Brazil in the short term, but in Venezuela and Russia, it didn't work. And it was one of the reasons that pushed Russia and Venezuela, especially Russia, even further away from the West. So, I mean, th there's a, there's a lot to say there, but maybe you can talk a little bit more about operation ajax and the role of the cia because you emphasized that, that the really in the driver's seat at the beginning of this attempt to try to overthrow mossadegh were the oil companies although we talked earlier about how the oil companies and the cia really had a revolving door so maybe talk about what operation ajax is and the role of the spy agency Right. This is where the CIA gets into the regime change business. The U.S. had been involved in regime change operations in the past and U.S. actors had, uh, you know, prior to World War II and prior to the creation of the CIA after World War II, you know, we toppled the government in Hawaii. Uh, the U.S. Uh, also got rid of Zelaya in Nicaragua in the early part of the 20th century. Um, they uh, did similar things in Panama, you know, staged a fake revolution and so on. But they didn't. Uh, there was a coup in Honduras done by a banana man uh, who later go, is involved in the coup in 1954 in Guatemala. But they hadn't at this point, 1953, there hasn't been a CIA covert operation yet. OK, but they take over this operation. Uh, there's a book on this. There's a, even a graphic novel of uh, adaptation of this uh book by Stephen Kinzer, Operation Ajax. It's on Operation Ajax. Stephen Kinzer wrote two books that were relevant to this. The first was All the Shaw's Men, uh, which I read a long time ago, and then Overthrow has it as a chapter. But All the Shaw's Men is really all about the coup. Years later, they did a graphic novel, which I think you can buy. I think Verso published a hardback version of it, and then you could buy another one for like tablets, and it actually linked to some of the documents. So it was pretty cool. I'd recommend checking that out. Uh, but it has... You know, it deals with all the, the main characters, which were the Brits and the Brit and the uh, Americans and uh, Iranian figures. Mossadegh, most notably, uh, Churchill personally asked Harry Truman to have the CIA oust Mossadegh. Uh, he even sends Avril Harriman to try to negotiate with Mossadegh and Harriman fails. Harriman is like the the scion of a, a oil, of, not, sorry, a railroad robber baron family. A uh, huge establishment guy. So these investment banks like Brown Brothers Harriman, that's of course the Harriman that they're talking about. Um, and he's he does he fails, and the uh, Churchill wants Truman to actually just go ahead and do you know launch this coup to oust this guy. Truman refuses and says we look like the worst imperialists. I don't want to do this. Uh, in November of 1952, the CIA actually starts planning Operation Ajax, even though they have not been given authorization to do so. So this is an early example of the CIA, uh, you know, thinking that it knows best and that it has the ability to set policy. Uh, and they kick off this coup, uh, and it's depicted in the, the graphic novel pretty well, uh, with uh, many of the techniques that they use to launch coups up to this present day. You bribe the right people. British embassy uh, is court helps to coordinate this, giving money to people to organize street mobs. Um, one of the things that they did was uh, they, they had the warriors of Islam pretend to be communists and blow up mosques in order to discredit Mossadegh and say he's a communist. Um, when I, when Eisenhower takes over 
he he quickly reverses Truman. By July 1953, he gives the green light to Operation Ajax, and it it goes it it goes off. In August, the Shah has kind of cold feet, and he's a little worried. Uh, he refuses to sign a CIA decree dismissing Mossadegh. He's the pu the puppet that the U.S. has uh, selected, um, and he gets a little nervous and flees the country after he finally does sign it in mid-August. Uh, it looks like the coup is not going well, and so they send a stop cable, basically stop the coup cable uh, into Kermit Roosevelt, who's the, the CIA's man on the ground there, uh, which he ignores, uh, thinking that the tide is about to turn, and it does. And on August 18th, the mob violence is so crazy uh, that, and and the there's so much chaos there uh, that, the eventually by the end of the day, a uh, general Zahidi is the new prime minister and Mohammed, a Mohammed Mossadegh's government. Uh, the main figures are either arrested or they are in hiding. Um, you can see some images on the internet that deal with the coup, these CIA orchestrated mobs. And the, there's all this violence involved with this one person in the, in the crowd. I recall reading was actually like dismembered, you know, like they sort of pull his body apart uh, these thugs that the CIA hired. And uh, it's just like, that's a CIA coup. You have some atrocities. If there's violence, then you can blame it on the government. Uh, you you pay, you throw money around to organize these things. I and mean, we were talking about 2014 in Maidan, but it's just like all of these things are like right in the CIA wheelhouse up, not only the organization, the organizing of the protesters, but then you have violence that gets blamed on the regime that you're trying to get rid of, right? They try that in Venezuela with Chavez also. I mean, this is just like one of the oldest tricks in the book. This is where it's, you know, it's funny to see the well, not funny, it's awful, but the way the history repeats itself. Uh, well, they, yeah, I mean, they're, they're trying it right now as we speak in Iran. I mean, today's September 30th, and, you know, we see a very similar situation in Iran. Right. Yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll revisit that uh, right at the end here. Uh, but yeah, this is this 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 was the outcome. It was very the CIA overthrew Mossadegh's government. Mossadegh was distrustful of the British, and so he kicked them out as best he could of the country. He he liked the Americans. He especially admired Roosevelt. Uh, he was a great admirer of uh, Roosevelt and the New Deal and American democracy. That's what he wanted to model Iran after. Okay, but he just he so sort of like Gorbachev, he made the fatal mistake of trusting. Uh, the United States, uh, and it, it cost him and it cost Iran very badly. Right. And as I alluded to earlier, um, and as you point out in the book, to, to quote from the book, uh, Peter Dell Scott's work, his chronology suggests that this operation actually started as an oil cartel operation that only the CIA only joined later because of uh, of Truman's lack of approval. So when you said the CIA started planning quietly, even though they didn't have approval on it, what was really going on was an ongoing British petroleum operation in order to get rid of Mossadegh. Uh, that in, intelligence only got on board with later. And so we see there, and as we'll talk about in a minute, something like United Fruit in Guatemala has a very similar uh, a way that events play out where we see a, a blurred line between corporations and the public state, which a blurred line there uh, might ring a little familiar uh, because that is pretty much the textbook definition of fascism. And, and, and so we see the way that this interplay happens before intelligence is really able to take over as sort of the king of all things covert operations and uh, is sort of the go-to where corporations can just kind of ask ITT can come to the CIA or to Nixon and say, hey, you know, we have a problem with Allende. Can you ha handle this for us? Uh, at this time, they're a lot more willing and, and able to just take matters into their own hands if they need to. And so we see the way that that plays out here and the way that U.S. empire's interests align with oil corporations. So what does, in the end, Ajax achieve for that nexus between the U.S. empire and then the interests that we're spending all this time pushing for the coup? Well, I think, uh, so you can take it back to basics and say, let's define imperialism. I like Michael Parenti's definition, which says that imperialism is the process by which the politico-economic elites of one nation expropriate for their own aggrandizement the resources, markets, uh, labor, and land uh, of another nation, right? And this is what they did is the, the oil of Iran gets 
uh, utilized for the benefit of American oligarchs. Uh, and this is a little bit different stylistically from the Mongols who would like, you know, come in and chop off heads when they needed to and rape and plunder and burn down cities uh, to, to get to acquire wealth and territory. That way you have you no know, CIA officers and Wall Street lawyers and so on. And so it's structured differently, but it's the same idea. It's imperialism. And Iran becomes a client state of the U.S. And I think that this is well illustrated by some key examples that we can see. Obviously, you have the oil money and the, the oil revenues are divided with British Petroleum getting a smaller share, oil companies getting a larger share, Iran getting more than it was at the worst moments under the Shah with BP running it, but still it's a beneficial for the West and not so much for Iran. Uh, additionally, you have the uh, enormous amount of wealth that goes into the military industrial complex, like the Shah using oil revenue uh, to purchase F-14s, you know, massive amounts of U.S. armaments. They buy huge amounts of U.S. weapons and are kind of the, a U.S. garrison in the region. You have all of that oil money left over and the national finances of Iran that are, get put in Chase Manhattan Bank. So by the time that the Shah, his regime is teetering in the late 70s, there's billions of dollars in David Rockefeller's Chase Manhattan Bank. Uh, so this is the way that it's that it's done. And that money, because it's it, the U.S. banking system, those billions of dollars that Rockefeller has access to and Chase Manhattan has access to, gets leveraged into much greater amounts in terms of loans that are put out, which are then collected at, at you know compound interest. So this is the way that that the whole uh, racket, the whole racket works. That is international capitalism. Uh, and late, additionally, in the 1970s, when the U.S. needs a high oil price to deal with uh, Vietnam financial shocks and and the dollars you know, troubling status and the huge amounts of dollars that are piling up in central banks around the world, the oil companies raise, or the oil producing company, countries like Iran and Saudi Arabia raise oil prices at the request of the United States, very high, causes huge problems, but it deals with the dollar issue, right? So this is why Iran is a super useful ally for the United States. And that's why Saudi Arabia was a really useful ally for the United States. Additionally, because Iran is this puppet state, They, the U.S. is able to uh, take advantage of its security services. And when the CIA is under scrutiny for like the first and last time in its history, basically in the 1970s, they're able to set up a, a fake or a, a sort of satellite CIA, a sock puppet CIA, a Frankenstein CIA. I don't know what the best metaphor is, but they set up the Safari Club, which uses the intelligence agencies of Iran uh, that the CIA created itself called Savak along with uh, some other, you know, the Saudis and other allied intelligence agencies so that they can continue to carry out covert operations uh, even without the CIA being involved. So that's the deep state. The deep state, those oil companies are the ones that really start the coup to get most of the egg rolling. And these forces uh, untethered from the U.S. government, not sanctioned by the Constitution outside and above it, they also create uh, the alternative to the CIA when the CIA is out of business for just a little bit in the 70s. Uh, this is why it's so useful to have all of these networks and all this wealth at its disposal uh, for the U.S. empire. So you already kind of touched on this, but but just kind of to keep going on this subject, what has been the impact then on the region, uh, for Iran, and then for world history as a result of Ajax and then the, the following history beyond just the CIA, but for the Middle East, which obviously uh, is still feeling the effects today? Well, for... The obvious effect for Iran is that they get this puppet dictator and this brutal despotic regime uh, to rule over them from 1953 to 1979. Uh, the Shah and his family got to enjoy the peacock throne and all of their gil golden and gilded finery uh, that they got to wear to official functions. Uh, and they made a lot of money for a lot of people. Uh, not so much for the Iranian people who were not doing very well. Uh, on top of the being economically exploited by th this sort of neo-colonial arrangement, you had the Savak um, agency, intelligence agency created by the CIA, which was brutally uh, repressing any opposition to the Shah and to the, the, uh, the puppet status of the Iranian nation. 
Uh, they were notorious for killing or torturing people. They, they would mutilate people sometimes, like cut off noses. I've read about that in a few different places is one of the methods that they use. They were horrifying. And um, it was funny, when I was at Temple University, I was talking about this one time, and I had a student, a young woman, who was in marketing and took my class and was just very nice very and a bright student. And she was one of those, like sometimes people that you just you get along with more than others and or they think that you're funnier maybe even more than you they think you're funnier than most people do she seemed to like laugh at all my jokes and stuff and was a really nice nice student agreeable and then one time uh when we get to this part in history i'm talking about this and she says yeah my grandfather was in savak and they beheaded him after the revolution and she didn't look exactly she wasn't laughing this time but she wasn't crying or anything either and i was like oh well I'm sorry, I Savak was pretty bad, but I don't really support the death penalty. And she was like, "Oh, he, it's okay. I never actually met him." I was like, "Okay, okay, well, that's, that's good. Let's just move right along. I'm not going to talk about your decapitated grandma, grandfather anymore." But the point is, the Iranian people were subjected to really horrific state repression. Uh, a, a CIA cut out an invention uh, set up to the designs of the CIA to brutally repress this population, kind of modeled on British methods of counterinsurgency and then colonial administration and terror. Uh, this is what they got. And uh, this is a damaging to the cause of, of nationalism in the region and secular nationalism. So Mossadegh didn't want an Islamist government uh, and neither did people like Nasser. They were more on the progressive side of things. They were what the, and they were what the Arab, the, the Muslim world and the Arab world, the, the Iranian, you know, Persian ethnicity, all these people in this part of the world the majority of them did not want this austere, uh, you know, Islamist kind of leadership. This was something that was more useful for the West for sort of social control purposes. They back these movements and these uh, despotic leaders. So uh, what this leads to despotism and a rise of Islamist, you know, uh, ideology across the Middle East, when in fact, if, it, if left to their own devices, they would have rallied behind people like Mossadegh, people like Nasser. Uh, they wouldn't have like the, the hijab requirement and so on, which they're talking about so much now, which is not really something the U.S. is genuinely concerned about um, because, you know, the U.S. hated Mossadegh and they loved uh, the people in the Saudi Arabia who were the, the worst religious fanatics as far as this goes. Now it's just a convenient thing for the United States. Um, the U.S. really is not on the side of progress unless by coincidence they, they backed the worst regimes in order to maintain neo-colonialism. They might use woke propaganda now, like on the same time that we're supporting the Saudis who chop off, you know, people's heads for blasphemy in the public square. We're supposed to believe that the United States is really concerned about the, the plight of Iranian women. You know, it's just, this is ludicrous, but this is, this is what they do. And um, this is quite a, uh, the, what happens in 1953 and these issues that we've been talking about here, and I think this is a good way to wrap this one up, is think about 1953 and some of these, these issues. You have the hydrogen bomb, which really means that with this development, the U.S. does have the ability to end all life on Earth. These bombs are so powerful. They don't know about nuclear winter yet, but basically hydrogen bombs plus nuclear winter that would result from the use of hydrogen bombs means that the American empire has the ability to end, huma end humanity, to end human civilization uh, if it chooses. And it holds on to this power. It doesn't try to get rid of nuclear weapons. It acquires and may holds on to this power and resists uh, the uh, opportunities to get rid of this power. So this is something worth noting. They also demonstrate that the U.S. will ignore the U.N. Charter, break the law by violating the U.N. Charter, which is ratified by the Senate, by overthrowing a sovereign government. Okay, a democratically elected sovereign government. Anyway, the, the UN Charter doesn't just outlaw aggression against other democracies, but in this case, the US overthrew a sovereign state. So the US asserted its ability to, or its divine right, to be able to overthrow any government if it wants to and to lie about it after the fact. And additionally, in 1953, the US uh, assassinates one of its own employees of this national security state, Frank Olson, He's tossed out of a window after previously being dosed with acid. Uh, he was deemed a security risk and someone who might have spilled the beans on illegal biological warfare that was going on in Korea. And as such, they decided they had to get rid of him. 
uh, the, the details of this have never been totally confirmed, but we've got enough now to say that in all likelihood that appears what happened, that he was eliminated by the state. So that's the U.S. national security state saying that it can execute American citizens even without due process if it deems them a security risk and that they can lie about that as well, you know, that it's to be done plausibly with plausible deniability and protected by state secrecy. So the U.S. under Eisenhower with this imperial behemoth is something quite different from the limited government of, uh, you know, John Locke and the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights and all this. You now have them asserting their divine right to have the ability to destroy humanity with nuclear weapons, to overthrow any government whenever they want to, and to even uh, assassinate without any sort of due process their own citizens, their own uh, agents in the national security state. So this is a very, very heavy set of prerogative powers that the U.S. empire has assumed for itself and this is all happening with this kindly, grandfatherly-like character, Eisenhower, in the White House, and Americans happy to be reading Playboy magazine, watching color television, uh, buying, driving around in big cars, and so on, uh, starting to listen to rock and roll. I mean, it's, it's amazing to think about the culture in America versus like some of these imperial realities, uh, but a lot of things that are still bedeviling us to this day get established during uh, this time period. So it's really worth going and looking at, and especially looking at Eisenhower and oil, Wall Street, Sullivan and Cromwell. We can kind of see it all here. Very well said, Aaron. I think that's a good note to end on. There's still a lot of history we're going to go through. We're not even done with this section yet, but we're at over an hour. So we'll continue discussing the CIA-backed coup uh, in, in Guatemala in 1954 and the very suspicious death of Frank Olson in the next part. This was part 14 of the Empire and Deep State series. I'm Ben Norton of Multipolarista, joined by Aaron Good and Seamus McGinnis of the American Exception podcast. If you want to uh, find the past episodes, you can go to patreon.com slash American Exception and also patreon.com slash Multipolarista. Consider supporting both of our shows. And if you're listening to this, the, the podcast version comes out first. Um, you're probably listening to it on Patreon. But if you're watching it on YouTube, there's also a, um, there's a playlist of the past episodes. And we, are, we have many more uh, episodes to go. We're going through the history of the U.S. national security state and the U.S. deep state. So this episode is a continuation of the history of the U.S. national security state. And there's a lot more coming soon. But uh, we'll 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 continue that in the next episode. Uh, any final thoughts, Aaron? Thank you very much, Ben and Seamus. Cool. We'll see you all next time. <laughs>